few weeks ago, another point of interest that uh, I really enjoyed trotting out for your, uh, for your information. A few weeks ago, an email included a link to a recording of a meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Pretty dry stuff, I guess, uh, although I'm sure there's plenty of excitement from time to time. On the, on the agenda that evening, in February 1998, was a discussion of a proposed trail from Casco Bay south to Kittery, based on a 1973 Maine DOT report. There may be others here this evening who were in attendance at that meeting, but three I know for sure are with us. Call them visionaries, call them pioneers, call them 60s radicals. <laughs> but be sure to call them if you want to build a trail. I'd like to introduce uh, those three who were in attendance at that council meeting 18 years ago. Uh, Sue Allen Bardwell. Tom Daly. and uh, see what they have wrought. Whenever, whenever I get a little uh, frustrated with the way things are going, I think of Johnny Andrews plugging away at it for as long as he has. Uh, actually, take a look, uh, once again, getting back to the ETA website, uh, there is a link to that meeting, and uh, no, my idea of fun is not uh, dialing up old uh, town council meetings. <laughs> However, when that link was passed around, uh, Tom had it on an old VHS tape. We had it uh, refurbished and put into digital format. Uh, it, it's clean, it's uh, terrific content, and uh, I sat and watched it for 20, 20 minutes one day, and it was just a hoop to uh, go back 18 years with these people that uh, I'm familiar with. And uh, you know, everything that John, Sue Ellen, and Tom promised is coming true. And uh, it underscores the remarkable role that, that the town of Scarborough has played in the trail's development. Thank you, town of Scarborough. Uh, the fact that these three remain involved, I think, really underscores what the Eastern Trail effort has been, has been about. People working together toward a goal that is benefiting others. It's benefiting local businesses. It's being used to sell houses. It is hosting events like MS benefits and triathlons and 5Ks. It is benefiting Maine's two most populous counties. It's another reason for visitors to come to Maine. It's a means of getting people up, outdoors, and moving. The Eastern Trail is a linear park that transcends town boundaries, linking hundreds of thousands of neighbors to each other. And you all are helping to make it happen. From the Eastern Trail Alliance to all our guests this evening, thank you very much. Closing the gap is an exciting next step in the development of the Eastern Trail. A 1.6 mile section connecting South Portland to Scarborough is now the subject of a huge fundraising campaign. The ETA has jumped in by pledging $50,000 in matching funds. Donors provide a contribution to this worthwhile project and the Eastern Trail Alliance will double it, up to $50,000. Uh, we don't have a basket to uh, pass around this evening. Uh, just want to remind you, however, that uh, donations, uh, as always, are gladly accepted. We have an iPad with a uh, credit card swipe. iPad with credit card swipe. <laughs> Okay then, so, so provisions have been made. Thank you trustees. So uh, talk to Carol, talk to Nancy, talk to Tim and they can help you out. Uh, <clears throat> with us this evening to fill in more details about the Close the Gap campaign is Jim Tassie from the Bicycle Coalition in Maine. Uh, for those who don't know Jim, uh, he started with the Bicycle Coalition in 2010 as the Education Director and was made Assistant Director in August of 2014. 
Uh, during Jim's time with the coalition, we have expanded and professionalized the education program, run in partnership with the Maine DOT, and brought mountain biking back into the coalition's program. He also developed, launched, and was the first director of the Community Spokes Advocacy Program. In 2015, Jim developed and launched the Coalition's Innovative Demonstration Project Campaign, Imagine Bikes Here. He is a League of American Bicyclists League Cycling Instructor, an IMBA Level 1 Certified Mountain Bike Instructor, and Trail Designer, and a graduate of the Lift 360 Community Leadership Intensive. Uh, we invited Jim, yes, all, that, all that's impressive, but uh, we're familiar with Jim's level of, uh, of, uh, of buying into bicycling, of uh, support for the bicycling community, and uh, basically uh, loving all things bicycle. Uh, I think you'll agree with uh, me that Jim's level ex of excitement will get you too motivated to uh, make your way to the uh, iPad. And, uh, and, and the swing feature. Uh, Bob Boker, what do you got? Motion to adjourn the annual business meeting. It's been moved to adjourn the annual business meeting. Joe, Joe has just seconded. Uh, is there any conversation about that? All those in favor? Thank you, trustees. Bob, thanks for uh, catching that. <laughs> Before we get to Jim, just a little appetizer. And are we ready to take a look at our, our clip? Yes. Jim <coughs> Back in 1998, little did trail supporters suspect, I think, that in 2016, a senior at Thornton Academy would be able to send a camera aloft and create footage of sections of the Eastern Trail. ETA staff asked around and found a, a drone owner, also an Eastern Trail supporter. So Isaac Patry and friend Steve Pate have, uh, have done it. They put a drone up in the sky and have given us some footage of portions of the Eastern Trail. What are we going to see? Uh, well, not OK. Uh, this is about a four minute overview of the trail, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. to the Nonsense River where it abruptly stops at the moment and then a fly over the river a few times all the way out to Wayne Wright Field where it picks up again and back. Anything else in there, Nancy? No, it's, it's really... We have senior from Thornton County yes. who's going yep. to Worcester Polytech next year. He's very excited about it. And uh, he and uh, Steve excited and Pete uh, volunteered their time and they love the, uh, they love the trail and they wanted to get this done for us. So we thank them very much. <coughs> yeah, I, um, they wanted to, Steve and Isaac here? No, I no? Steve made it, and Isaac had, Isaac a, had a Right, I was going to say, <laughs> Isaac had a lacrosse game, so, that, <coughs> there you are.
like um, Scarborough folks in the area. Does that look like Hannaford area? Yeah, yeah. 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 That would be gap number one over the river. Good evening, and thanks for hanging around long enough to hear me talk. My name is Jim Tasky, I'm the Assistant Director of the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. I'm very happy to be here to speak with you all tonight. The original plan was to put chains on the door and basically get you all lined up on the, uh, the square and the iPad, but cooler heads prevailed, and so you're just going to hear me talk. Um, and I'm going to talk about the Close the Gap program. Jim, I'll give you the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Close the Gap campaign. Then I'm going to go uh, into a little bit of a, a conversation um, that just sort of engages you with the, the bigger issues of bicycle and pedestrian advocacy and how getting involved with the Eastern Trail serves that. And finally, I'll give you a call to action. Um, but really, I want to emphasize right from the get-go, this is a call to action. Um, we have an opportunity to do something that is unequivocally, unambiguously good. And there aren't many opportunities in our lives where you get the opportunity to be involved with something that is good in a completely clear way that will last for hundreds of years. Well, maybe a hundred years. But it's hard to say. I mean, when we build a facility like this, this is something that's going to outlive us all. Next slide, please. So, how many of you, any members of the Bicycle Coalition of Maine in here? Very good, very good. Thank you very much for your membership and your support. Um, how many of you have heard of the Bicycle Coalition of Maine? Excellent, good. For those of you who haven't, I'm going to give you a little bit of a primer. I hope you all consider getting involved with the Bicycle Coalition of Maine because we do a lot of things that support the interests of people like you. Um, if you're involved with the Eastern Trail, you know, join the Eastern Trail Alliance, but the Bicycle Coalition of Maine is really a, uh, a sibling organization with that organization, and we encourage you to get involved with us as well. Well, we've been around for quite a number of years now. We were founded in 1992. Um, we have about 5,000 members. Um, depends how you count it, those are household members, so it could be a little higher than that, could be a little lower than that, but that's the number we go with. Um, our funding comes from those membership dollars as well as through foundation grants, contracts with uh, people like the DOT and PACS and the CDC, and um, charitable donations. Next slide, please. So the Bike Coalition of Maine does kind of four broad things. Um, number one, we do events. We have a couple of events. We do some education work. We do some advocacy work. And we do other things. Um, next slide, please, just to illustrate these. So events, um, we do two bike swaps in the state of Maine, one in Orono, one in Portland. They're called bike swaps, but they're really used bike sales. They're gigantic events that um, give people the opportunity to purchase a bicycle at a reduced cost, get introduced to the sport, um, find a commuter vehicle, find something that gets them uh, cheap transportation to get to work or to run errands or just for fun. Um, hugely successful, very popular events. We had our Portland one just a few weeks ago. Always a good time. Um, if you've never been to one, I strongly urge you to check it out, um, see what you can find. And if you don't uh, have any interest in buying a bicycle, you might have a bicycle in your garage or barn that uh, you'd like to get rid of. And this is the perfect opportunity to do that. So. Keep it in mind for next year. We'll, uh, we do it every, uh, every year at the end of April. So uh, the Orono one is two weeks before the end of April, and the um, Portland one is usually the last week of April. We have our women's ride coming right up. That's uh, a ride that's based in Freeport. It is just what it sounds like. It is a women's ride. Uh, men are welcome to come and volunteer, but you will not be permitted to ride in it. Um, but it is a celebration of bicycling and uh, the Sisterhood of Riders, and uh, it's always a very popular and fun event that's based in Freeport. 
Our lobster ride comes up in July, and that is uh, just a fantastic ride in a beautiful part of the state. It's uh, based out of um, Rockland, and this year it's going to be based out of Camden, which is in the kind of the upper mid coast area. Um, rides of varying lengths. You can do everything. You can actually do a double century if you wanted to. There's 200 mile loops, 50 mile loops, 30 mile loops. And at the end of it, you get simply the best lobster roll you will ever get at any kind of organized event. <coughs> if you've done the trek across Maine and you've got their lobster roll, let me tell you, there's no comparison. <laughs> Finally, we do Bike Maine. This is a large event that we've uh, just started about three years ago. Um, it's an ambitious event where it's a seven-day bike tour. It's in a different place, every part of the state. And the cool thing about Bike Maine is that it is an event that is designed to really kind of churn money back into the state. So Bicycle, um, Bike Maine uses you know, locally sourced foods, it engages a lot of local businesses, um, it engages volunteers in the communities that we're working with. We set up a tent city, people ride from point to point, the communities just come out and pour their hearts out um, in enthusiasm for this event. And, um, I didn't bring up the, uh, the, the metrics to show you the numbers, but Bike Maine last year generated $488,000 um, that went right back into the Maine economy. So the idea is that these people are coming, they're spending money, they're touring, and they're putting money right back into the Maine economy. And one of the reasons that we're so um, excited about Bike Maine is that it really becomes an object lesson in the power of bicycling as a way to drive economic growth. And uh, we're focusing on this year's ride up in Washington County. Um, huge uh, enthusiasm for the event up there this year. We're actually rolling out, for any of you guys who are business owners, we just rolled out for this year's um, Bike Maine a thing called Bicycles Welcome, which is a um, bicycle-friendly uh, business training. So you can get certified as a bicycle-friendly uh, bicycle business. and. Um, you get a little thing that you can put on your storefront that encourages people to come and visit you because bicycles are a lo bicycle riders are a loyal group. If they know you get it and they have the choice of serving uh, or getting served at a business that gets it, they're going to go there. So stay tuned for more about bicycles. Well, next slide, please. <coughs> we do education. I started um, with the coalition as the education director in partnership with DOT. Um, I run a program that serves about. 12 to 15,000 people annually in face-to-face -face presentations um, with information about bicycle and pedestrian safety. My morning, in fact, started out making two presentations at uh, Palm Cove Elementary School in Cape Elizabeth, so I'm still in the trenches doing these presentations. Um, but we do stuff for all ages. We are available to send instructors to your Rotary Club, to um, you know any kind of civic organization that's looking for a speaker. Uh, we have talks that are strictly educational in nature and others that are a little bit more thought-provoking, as maybe you'll see a little later. Um, the education program includes rides, it includes presentations, it includes uh, worksite talks. If you look in the lower left there, you can see one of our rodeo courses. We are the go-to entity for the state for conducting bike rodeos, which are really fun events for kids. Um, we have a mountain bike program now. We do a lot of stuff if you need to get any bicycle or pedestrian education, um, talk to me later. Next slide, please. Advocacy is a big part of our work, and by advocacy, you know, we try to inflect the advocacy to mean something more like community leadership. Advocacy can sometimes sound like a polarizing activity, but at the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, we're about building relationships, we're about having constructive, collaborative conversations, and um, our success in that area has been, you know, just astonishing to me. Um, we've got great relationships with police departments across the state, with the main DOT, with the main CDC, with uh, various local transportation entities, and um, what we're trying to do is make incremental, steady change to kind of move the needle towards a main that is more walkable and bikeable. And incidentally, you'll hear me talk about walking quite a bit. Um, the Bicycle Coalition of Maine in uh, 2014 officially um, adopted walking as part of its mission. So although we are still called the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, our mission explicitly includes walking now too. So we are the state's principal uh, walking advocacy organization as well. And that just reflects a lot of the work that we're doing anyway with DOT and other entities. Um, 
what you see here is a picture of, uh, well, this is a South Portland committee, in fact. Uh, I know that Jim Gailey's in the room. He might recognize Tex and, uh, sitting there. Um, this is how advocacy looks. You sit down and you have conversations with people. These are members of our community spokes program. We have um, about 100 individuals that we've given training to in the basics of community mobilization, the basics of what you can do on the roads to make them safer and more attractive to bicycling, and um, they're exceeding our expectations in the things that they're doing. Next slide, please. And we do other stuff. Um, one of the most interesting things I'll mention is that we put DOT engineers and project managers on bicycles. Um, last week I did my first training for the year Well, what we do is we we go up to DOT, we give them an hour presentation, they actually review some of their policies, um, because it's good to get reminded of what the policies you're supposed to be uh, abiding by are. Um, and then we put them on a bike, and we take them on an hour-long bike ride that lets them see exactly what it's like to be on the side of the road with cars going by. I call it empathy training for engineers. And it's, uh, it's been very well received. Um, I'm doing one next week, and uh, Commissioner Bernhardt himself is going to be joining us uh, in the next class. So. Uh, no pressure, but don't forget about that. Our walking school bus program is one of our initiatives with the Maine CDC. This is a program in which we um, basically stipend someone at a school to set up these volunteer walking groups so the kids can you know, get to school without having to either ride a bus or take the parade of minivans in. Um, and at least one community in Maine, in Norway, Maine, this program was so successful that the community canceled a bus route. They actually just got rid of the bus route. They saved $30,000 annually, and uh, the transportation director is ecstatic about it. And the teachers say that the kids are, you know, they're they're better prepared for school as a result of getting a little activity on the way in. Um, the CDC is very excited about it, and they're starting to do more robust evaluations of it. But that's one of the things that we are involved with. If any of you guys run big events, we provide valet parking for events. Um, you know, we do a lot of different things, and uh, it's very exciting to work with the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. And under the other category, we do stuff like this. We're involved with the Eastern Trail. We do a lot of infrastructure work, whether it's reviewing plans and offering comments, or getting down in the trenches about efforts to, um, you know, really create better infrastructure in Maine that makes things uh, more attractive and simple and easy and uh, comfortable for walking and bicycling. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit now about the Close the Gap campaign and about the Eastern Trail. And I'm assuming, as Bob is, all of you guys are aware of the Eastern Trail. And I think the thing about the Eastern Trail that's most interesting is that this is a trail that's not a local trail. I mean, it is a local trail, but it's also a regional trail. It's a state trail. It's a national trail. The Eastern Trail is really you know, just a, a, little, a little sliver of something that's much, much bigger. Next slide. So, on the national scale, the Easter Trail is part of the East Coast Greenway. And the East Coast Greenway, how many of you have heard of the East Coast Greenway before? Okay, so most of you guys know about the Greenway. This is a trail that runs the length of the Eastern Seaboard, from Key West in Florida all the way to Calais. And it is an ambitious project that seeks to create a continuous route off-road the entire way. Um, not there yet. The Eastern Trail uh, is uh, an important piece of this in our area, but um, there are places where the East Coast Greenway has to ride on roadway um, rather than be completely off-road. Next slide. So it's a trail of state significance. You can see that this is the, uh, the route of the East Coast Greenway in the state of Maine. It kind of bends up towards uh, Bangor a little bit and then gets down back towards uh, the coast in Washington County. Um, next slide. More locally, this is where we are. And you can see this is our gap. Next slide. So this is a close-up of the gap that we're trying to fill. And the segment that you see here illustrated in red, in red it's kind of hard to see perhaps on the, uh, the ortho photo, but that's Wainwright Fields on the upper part where the blue trail comes in that's finished. And the red trail is uh, coming down to Pleasant Hill Road, where the yellow trail meets. Uh, that's exactly where Pleasant Hill is. And then the trail runs through um, 
a segment of the uh, the uh, CMP power line corridor, and then it goes into the floodplain of the Nonsuch River before finally meeting an old railroad abutment um, where a couple of physical exist. Um, the red section that you see is slated for construction starting next year. The yellow section is really the piece that we're trying to pull together resources to make sure we can get it finished up on. Ah, thanks, Kim. Nice. So, Wainwright Field, Krebs Pond. This is uh, Pleasant Hill right here, Pleasant Hill Road. This is the uh, route that's going to take us to the Nonsuch River right here. This is the gap. Next slide, please. So this is a substantial project. Um, the two sections combined from Wainwright Field all the way to the Nonsuch River is uh, coming in at about $3.8 million. The project is currently in its final design phase. Fundraising is underway. That's why one of the reasons why we're here tonight to talk a little bit about that. Uh, total raised so far is in the vicinity of $2.8 million. Um, this includes some money that we got from DOT. Um, uh, Scarborough planner Dan Bacon and I were at a conference um, last, I guess it was last fall, no, it was last spring, and uh, we happened to bump into the chief engineer who had been telling us, of, of the DOT, and she had been telling us how enthusiastic uh, the DOT was about getting the Eastern Trail finished, and, and we kind of pulled her aside and said, you know, we would probably be a lot more successful at fund fundraising if we had a letter that really spelled out the DOT commitment. And the DOT came through with a letter committing $1.5 million, which they then bumped up to $1.55 million. Um, at that point, things began to happen. Um, a number of the um, local uh, transportation entities, most notably PACS, the Portland Area Comprehensive Transportation System, then committed another $650,000. Um, I've got a slide that talks about the, uh, the specific funders, but that letter from DOT really made a uh, difference in getting us going. So the upshot of it is that we've raised about 2.8 million of 3.8 million. So we've got about one to go. But urgency is growing. Um, basically, we need to have this money raised by the end of this year. By, uh, we don't have to have it in hand, but we have to have it at least committed. And we're talking with private donors, with corporations, with individuals in order to come up with the funds to get this critical piece of um, roadway, of uh, trail finished. Um, and what we're telling people is that, you know, I mean, what a boon for a corporation to associate itself with a trail of this level of significance. And um, we've, got some, we've got some good interest in uh, some substantial donations to the trail, but the commitments aren't formalized and final yet, so we're hustling hard to uh, see what we can line up. Next slide. So one of the interesting things about um, the funding mechanism for the Eastern Trail, or for this segment of the Eastern Trail, is that due to the way in which uh, the DOT and PACs and the feds really work, for every 20 bucks that we raise, we can get 80. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity for us to get, you know, basically $80 for every 20 that's donated. So, um, if you ever wanted to stretch your money, this is an opportunity to really, you know, get a lot of bang for your buck because, again, you're getting, you know, 80% on a 20% uh, donation. So, the math works out to things like if we raise $250,000, we release $1.6 million in federal funding. $520,000 releases $2.6 million in federal funding. So. It's really important that we raise cash so that we can leverage those cash dollars to get that 80% match from the feds. Um, I'd like to mention as well that a number of local um, construction companies, including Chimbro and Shaw, are very interested and involved in the project. And one of the things we're working on with those guys are ways in which they can provide in-kind donations and contribute to the project uh, in ways in addition to cash. Um, and Chimbro in particular has been kind of interested in perhaps doing some bridge fabrication for us. And um, that would bring the cost down. We're working this stuff out. A lot of moving parts here, but we're very excited about the, uh, the uh, interest of these corporations in Maine um, in this project. So as I mentioned, Maine DOT's 
down for 1.55 million, taxes in for 650,000, uh, towns and small donations are over $217,000. Uh, the town of Scarborough has actually, uh, just, just checking to make sure I can mention this now, uh, the town of Scarborough just as, uh, um, just, uh, I guess last week uh, committed $217,000 to this project, which is a big part of it. I've mentioned some of the other uh, uh, corporations that are involved, um, providing some in-kind construction uh, donations, C.D. Armstrong, who owns Rufus Deering, is very interested in the project. We're hoping to engage him in it as well. Um, but we still need about a million dollars cash to get us up over that $3.8 million threshold. This is simply uh, to give you some sense of the urgency. So uh, this is the construction timetable. And down at the bottom here, it's done. We're shooting to have this thing done by December 20th, 2017, which is, feels like it's coming up mighty fast. This is where we are right now. Um, so we're, you know, a good third of the way through our timetable, and we need to have the commitment for the additional million by here. So time is a running, and uh, you know, again, on the call to action theme, tell your friends, tell everyone you can. This is the time to get involved because we have an opportunity to get something done here that's really unique, long-lasting, and positive. But we need to move quickly to make it happen. So I'm going to just show you some pictures of the gap itself and, and some, of the, uh, some of the images. I think you've seen some of the images and, and some of the print materials, but um, we can talk them through a little bit more. So the first thing we're going to show you is this spot right here. So this is the Nunsuch River. And, oh, I'm sorry. Go back one. Trout's Pond. <laughs> and what you have here is Current conditions at Proud's Pond are a little bit kind of industrial and kind of, kind of, you know, tattered looking. Um, we're envisioning uh, a beautiful eight to ten foot wide trail with a stone dust finish, as you've seen other places in the uh, Eastern Trail, that would make for a beautiful walk or ride along Proud's Pond. Ah, here is the uh, Nunsuch River. Next slide. This is what it looks like now. If you've ever gone out to the end of um, the Eastern Trail on the, uh, the far eastern end of uh, Eastern Trail Road, you eventually come to this railroad abutment and it's ready for a bridge, it just doesn't have one. Next slide. This is the, uh, the preliminary design for the bridge that is being conceived of that would bridge that gap in the Nunsuch River abutments. And this is a photo simulation of what it might look like to actually be able to run, walk, do whatever you want to get over the Nunsuch River Bridge and I like the little guy in the kayak down there. <laughs> Next slide, please. So the big nut in this particular project is right here. So this is the Pan Am Rail Line. Hannaford's parking lot is, I think, about right here. Um, I guess Pleasant Hill Road's a little bit further over here, but this right here represents six lines of Pan Am Rail. Next slide. And it is a big bridge. Um, I know that the design is also constantly in a, in a state of process. Um, I think we've, we've shortened it to two spans rather than three spans, but this is nearly a $2 million bridge. Um, so this, this is a, a significant part of the cost of this project. Um, you know, you need to meet a number of parameters in order to put a bridge here. It's got to be high enough for trains to go under it. It's got to be wide enough so that it meets ADA standards so that it's possible to push a wheelchair up it safely and comfortably. Um, so it winds up being a bridge that's approximately 300 feet long. It is a big thing. Um, next slide. But it would really improve the overall theme. Um, here's what we have right now. And here you can see uh, a photo simulation of what the bridge might look like in place. And that would be a fantastic thing. You'd be able to come off Pleasant Hill Road, you'd go down a bit of CMP corridor, you'd get on this bridge, you'd go over the bridge, and then you'd be finding a trail that would wind its way to that Nunsuch River Bridge. So, what should we do? Well, contribute to the Eastern Trails Close the Gap campaign now. Uh, 
I, I, I still think that the chains on the door would work. But, um, tell your friends to contribute. I mean, this is the opportunity. I mean, you know, you guys in this room have a tremendous amount of power. You have networks. Talk to your friends. Tell them about this opportunity. You know, if you can't write a big check, a lot of small checks can really make this happen. But we all need to pull together and make this happen. If we're all pulling in the same direction and there's good momentum, great things can happen. Talk to local businesses that might be interested in getting involved in this effort. They will, uh, you know, again, they don't have to write a check for a half a million dollars, but every bit is going to help us get to that goal of one million dollars by the end of November this year. So now I want to talk about cars. And I want to talk about cars because I am not here merely to inform, but also to, I don't want to call it provoke, but I'll say provoke. I, I, I'm here to get you to think a little bit more. And one of the interesting things about the Eastern Trail is that getting involved with it is going to provide us with an opportunity to make a statement about how we as Americans and we as Mainers prioritize transportation funding. So, think about the place of the car in American culture. Next slide. We love cars. How many of you own more than one car? I'm a two-car owner. I have been a three-car owner. I have a Sienna minivan. I, I'm not shy to say that I love my minivan. And anyone who disses a minivan has never owned a minivan. Because minivans rock. They are giant toy boxes. They are awesome. Um, next slide. <laughs> yeah, they're transportation, but they're more. We eat in them. We socialize in them. Next slide. We watch movies in them. We have relationships in them. In, in the case of those people, on them. This one right here. You can, you know, on the hoods, okay. We have relationships with them. You know, the notion of loving your car, I think, is something that, you know, people get. You know, oh, you know. I'm going to bond with my car. I'm going to wash it and wax it carefully. Make it beautiful. I love this. found this cartoon. This guy's got romance on her mind. You can't quite see there, but she's picturing his car. <laughs> she likes the car. You know, we eat, buy coffee. We, you know, you get anything in the car. You can buy drive-through alcohol and guns um, from the comfort of your car. So, you know, we have truly designed our world to be car-friendly. <coughs> I would argue that cars are really a part of American mythology at this point. I mean, they've replaced the cowboy, uh, the cowboy's horse, as the vehicle of independence, of, you know, rugged individualism. Our cars are the freedom machines, and totally wrapped up in the notion of who we are as Americans, you know. Personal mobility, freedom, ah, wrapped in the American flag. Next slide. You know, and from the moment we're kids, we're really conditioned to look forward to the moment that we're drivers. How many of you guys had some kind of toy car when you grew up? Right? Girls too? You know, there were, no, no one had a, uh, the Barbie stuff? <laughs> the Barbie cars? Um, next slide. They're out there, you know, the Barbie cars. Um, and my sister had, she had this cool little VW van, you know, Barbie could drive around. But, you know, we're, we give kids car toys because it's what we do. You know, we're all, we're, we're all aspiring to be drivers when we're kids. I was just dealing with a bunch of second and third graders this morning, and as part of our education presentation, we talked about how, you know, riding a bike is like driving a car. You have to follow all the same rules. And I tell the kids, today's your first day of driver's ed. And they're like, whoa, really? Awesome. And, you know, they're excited about that. I mean, everyone's looking forward to the day they get their driver's license. Next slide. Hot Wheels. I had, to, I had to dig up some vintage pictures of Hot Wheels. I had that Hot Wheel. I had that one. That was a cool Hot Wheel. Um, but you know, car toys are everywhere. Next slide. This one. I mean, these guys are like, like you can picture their parents just by looking at these kids. You know, they're, they're like... <laughs> and, and, let, and let's be honest. If I was that age and I had that toy, I would have loved it. I would have been all over it. Um, but that's fine. You can go to the next one. But, but I want to point out that, you know, all this love for cars has some real downsides. You know, we pay considerable social costs for our love affair with the car. And I want you to think about that for a second. So, what are some of the downsides? 
of the American infatuation with the car. Dependence on foreign oil. We have to do business with people in parts of the world where they don't particularly like us. And we wind up having fights over there. The loss of a national public transit system. I mean, I bumped this one up because this one really hurts me. Um, I miss trains. I never lived in a place that really had train access. I've been to Europe, I've taken some trains uh, in the US from time to time. Train travel is amazing. And with the advent of the automobile, the train systems that we had essentially evaporated. How many of you guys know the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Right? So watch that movie again because the subtext of that movie, the bad guy in that movie is about killing mass transit and substituting in the car. It's, it's an interesting kind of dimension to that movie that you don't think about. But next time you see it, next time it's on, pay a little bit more attention to it. Um, next slide. So does anyone know what these are? This is the interurban trolley that existed in Maine. So prior to about 1930, Maine was laced with trolley tracks. You could ride, I could probably take a trolley to here, um, to, you know, in, back in the day. So the interurban trolley line, this is the Lewiston to Portland car, the Narcissus. Uh, these were electric cars that ran all over the region. Next slide. And when I say all over the region, I mean like, you know, Waterville is up there. You got, it's kind of a weird map. Augusta's right here. Um, Brunswick's right here. Lewiston's right here. Portland's right here. Cape Elizabeth is right here. All connected by trolley. All connected by mass transit. I mean, it didn't get you necessarily door to door, but the mobility that was achievable without having to hop in a car was tremendous. But our dependence on the car not only has withered away, you know, the interurban trolley line, it's really kind of impeded our progress towards a robust passenger rail system currently. So bullet trains, they exist other places. Next slide. So not a great slide here, but um, this shows you the, the high speed network in Europe. And if you got a little closer, you'd see this is completely laced with all kinds of tracks. High speed rail that'll go over 100 miles per hour. You can get from, let's see, you can get from, uh, I was in Lucca to Milan in Italy, which is, you know, would take you, I don't know, five, five, six hours by car. You can do it in like three hours on train. And you get on that train and it's just zoom. Next slide. In contrast, this is the American network. Looks pretty good, right? Well, the only part that's done is right there. That blue piece. That's the only high-speed passenger rail network that's existing in the United States right now. And our dependence on cars is one of the things that has choked the development of that system because our resources don't go there. Next slide. Congestion on the roads. We all know about that. Obesity. So one of the things you might not think about is the way in which our dependence on the automobile is actually driving the obesity epidemic. And the obesity epidemic is going to cost us billions. I used to work in public health and we you know, saw studies all the time and the projections about what it's going to cost to take care of people with diabetes and obesity related illnesses are, are just going to be <coughs> astonishing and catastrophic and potentially damaging to our economy. So these next slides, we're going to go through pretty quick, because this is a, uh, next slide. Oh, this is just a fun one. I like, this one, I like it. This one, the bicycle here says, this one runs on fat and saves you money. This one runs on money and makes you fat. Um, next slide. So has anyone seen these slides before? These are slides that indicate the growth of the obesity epidemic in the United States. And this slide, the first one here is 1990. And at this point, people who are obese, which is, you know, a BMI over 30, um, about, call it 30 pounds overweight, roughly, uh, for most average people. Only about 10 to 14 percent of the population of the United States at that point was obese. So just give me, like, just start clicking. So watch what happens here. So the blue here, stop second, so at this point, the darker blue indicates, oh, well, so now it's about 19% of the population. So we're getting to the point where it's about, you know, almost one in five 
is oh, you know, obese. Keep going. Okay, keep going, keep going. We're only in 1997. Okay, so at this point, where you start seeing the yellow, we're getting to a point where one in five to one in four percent of the population is obese. Keep going. So when we get to 2000, they actually have to get to the point where they have this, this number. So a red, a new color that indicates when we're like one in three people are obese. And by the time we get to 2009, that's the last slide, so pop back one, you can see that a good part of the United States has an obesity problem. And you might say, big deal. But the costs of treating the people who have illnesses related to obesity is, is going to be quite expensive and, and, as I said, potentially devastating. But it's all part of a cultural outcome that is related to our dependence on the car. We drive everywhere. We don't want to walk. We don't want to ride. We want to use motors to get everywhere. And our dependence on motors to get around is making us, you know, quite literally sick. Pollution, everyone talks about cars and pollution. There's a gratuitous slide of industrial, next one. There you go, industrial pollution. You know, some of it's car stuff, some of it's the industries that promote cars and, and produce cars. You know, let me be the first to admit that the bicycle industry also generates quite a bit of pollution when they make their, uh, their devices. So, um, you know, industry is what it is. Personal debt. Cars are expensive. I, I dug around a little bit, so for a very average car, you're spending approximately, you know, eighty-seven hundred dollars per year after, you know, the ownership, the depreciation of the costs, uh, the insurance, the fuel, the maintenance. This is from AAA. This is AAA saying this. The average cost of owning a car in the United States right now is about eighty-seven hundred dollars per year. That's a chunk of change. Personal injury. Cars are lethal. Next slide. So, in 2014, about 33,000 people died on the roads. About 16% of those people were walkers or bicyclists. Not so bad. This is the thing that's interesting, and this is really what I want to drive home as my point. 2% of the funding that goes to transportation goes to walking and biking. The rest of it is going, you know, to cars. A, a chunk of it goes to trains for sure and other transportation, but a lot of it is going to maintain the automotive system. And go back one. I just want to point out that, you know, if the bike peg world got 16% of, you know, the transportation budget, which would reflect the number of people, you know, the percentage of people killed on the roads in those modes, we would be fine. I mean, that, that amount of money would create a world-class bike pet system in the United States. But we're not there yet. Next slide. So, these are easy ones to talk about. Oil, obesity, pollution, whatever. But there's some other things about dependence on the car that maybe you haven't thought about. So, the thing about the car is that our dependence on it has resulted in a landscape that supports it and enables it and really does a little else. Next slide. So look at this picture. I don't know how you can see this, but can you see that little line right there? Let me see the next picture. That gets better. Ah, this is a better one. This is Freeport, incidentally. So what do you see going on here? What do you think caused that? People walking. They call these desire lines. They call these goat paths sometimes. But what they really are are they're places that indicate that people walk along this road. A lot of people walk along this road but there's no accommodation for it. That road is incomplete. That road is really only designed for cars, and it overlooks the fact that other people are using that road who are not in cars. Next slide. Another slide. Another slide. So, we've kind of made the decision in our transportation allocations that the most important thing is supporting cars. And a lot of our energy goes to designing roads and really it's almost like we've designed the world to say the cars are the priority mode. They're the most important thing. 
Whenever you go to a place and you don't see sidewalks in a place where you're like, well, how am I supposed to walk here? That is a vestige of that attitude, which is starting, I will say, to give way a little bit because people are realizing, you know, hey, it's nice to get out of your car and walk around. You know, when you go on vacation, you're not really picking it on the basis of how convenient it is to drive. You're, you know, you're going someplace where you can stop, get out of the car, and have a little fun. So the problem is, is that when we don't think about other modes, we wind up with roads that are incomplete and not comfortable to ride on. Next one. This poor guy pushing a couple kids on the edge of a road in his shoulder. This is my wife. This is on uh, Shore Road in Cape Elizabeth. This was actually an image that we used to actually make a change because now in Cape Elizabeth, there is a pathway that runs right here, the Shore Road pathway. Um, and big thanks to DOT for funding and supporting that. And we had a, a similar kind of fundraising campaign to make that happen. But prior to that, this road was quite a challenge to walk on. You see here the bike coming. So two cars, a bike, and a pedestrian here. What do you do? It's an incomplete road. And you'll hear about the Bicycle Coalition of Maine talking a lot about complete streets. Complete streets simply means all modes are thought about and accommodated. It doesn't mean everyone gets a bike path or a sidewalk. It means that everyone is accommodated somehow. This road's not quite there. Next slide. Kids walking home from school. No place to go. Next slide. This is Rutland, Vermont, actually, where I used to live. This is kind of a joke. This is what the sidewalks look like. People callously parking in places where they walk. Drives me nuts when I see people pulling their, you know, they'll, they'll parallel park and they'll put their wheels up on the sidewalk and force you out of the way. And it's really something that they're not thinking about so much because we live in a world in which the air we breathe almost is saturated with carness. You know, it's like, it's just the paradigm that we operate in. Next slide. So all of these pictures of what happens if we don't think beyond the car. Next slide. And so the big question is, what does this have to do with the Easter trip? Why, why is Jim up here ranting about cars? Um, and again, I'm a two-car owner. I like cars. Um, but cars have shaped our world in a way that's not always you know, accommodating to the kind of life we want to live. And the cool thing about the Eastern Trail is that by supporting the Eastern Trail, we get the opportunity to make a gesture in support of a different paradigm. We get to imagine a place where walking and biking and being out of your car and in a natural landscape you know, has the importance and value that it should. I think it's an easy way to demonstrate the need to reprioritize some of our, 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 our funding priorities. I, I mean, I'm going to say this. It, it's, this is probably the most controversial thing I'll say all night. But if the Eastern Trail was a road, it would have simply been built. Three million dollars is nothing in transportation. There are roundabouts going in across the state right now that cost three million dollars a piece. And the argument is, is that, well, they're regional, so it's a good spending of money. But we can't get full funding for a bike ped project. We are fighting to raise money to get the local match. And we're grateful to get the local match. We get to stretch our dollars, and that's a beautiful thing. But in the long run, the long game that the Bicycle Coalition of Maine is playing, and the long game that the Eastern Trail is playing, is ultimately to get the people who are making decisions about transportation funding to think, why that asymmetry? Why that systemic difference? Why can't we simply build facilities like the Eastern Trail outright? Because they are valuable. They drive economic activity. They promote health. They provide people with the opportunity to connect with their environment and the beautiful Maine landscape. So we need to build the Eastern Trail to tell the powers that be that we need more things like the Eastern Trail. So, we're back to what should you do today. <laughs> Did I mention that we have an iPad with a square? Um, you know, this is your opportunity. We need to support the Eastern Trail. You need to get your friends to support the Eastern Trail. You need to get business owners that you know to support the Eastern Trail, we need to close this gap. We need to make a statement that transportation dollars spent on things like the Eastern Trail is money well spent for the local economy, the regional economy, for the state economy, for the national economy. 
if you want to send me a hate email, <laughs> I can reach it at jim at bikemain.org. Thank you so much for listening to me tonight. So Carol's up here too. If any questions about the Easter Trail, about the close the gap, we can well pop it right out here. Yes. Well, so the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, um, we run the Safe Routes to School program in partnership with the Maine DOT, and um, what we do is work with schools a lot to try and get them to imagine letting kids walk and bike to school. So our walking school bus program is one of the things that we're doing to try to get kids, you know, to get to school without a motor vehicle. And um, one of the interesting bonuses of it is that we're, we're hearing from our, we ran an experiment in Portland, and people are now saying it's okay for the kids to walk to school. The stranger danger issue is not as bad as we thought. Kids can do it. And the kids are actually learning road skills, and so as the parents get more confident seeing them do it, you know, more kids are walking to school. Um, biking to school, still pushing on that a little bit. You, you might be surprised to know that a lot of schools across Maine actually have policies that explicitly say you cannot walk or ride to school. So one of the things that the Safe Roots team and I do is work with these schools to try and get them to revise those policies. We provide them with education. Sometimes we'll actually provide um, guided rides and do some leadership to encourage the kids to imagine doing it. We set up bike trainings and volunteer groups led, um, you know, to lead kids to school. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're pushing on that front as hard as we can. Drives me nuts. But the answer, it's a policy question, it's a policy issue because the school policy is that they want to have control of the kid from the moment they leave the stairs to the moment they enter the school. And so um, there's a real reluctance to let the kids be unsupervised walking along the roads. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an ongoing battle, and, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do things like that. I mean, Norway, that same transportation director up in Norway that canceled the bus route, he's on your page. It's like, why can't the kids walk, you know, 500 feet, 1,000 feet to a bus stop? You and I walk, right? I mean, people walk. I, w I mean, my bus stop was nearby, but the bus stop aggregated kids from the area, and that's where we got on. Um, so, you know, that is part, but, but again, the cultural paradigm is such that there's stranger danger. You know, people are afraid that their kids are going to get, you know, abducted, and, you know, it happens very infrequently, and usually when it does happen, it's actually a family member that's doing it, you know, in, in nine times out of ten. But that one time that it doesn't happen that way, it, it's traumatizing and no one wants to hear about it. So the, the attitude is, let's not let our kids go outside at all. I mean, there's, you know, there, there's a woman, uh, um, say Lenora Canese, who talks about the free-range kids. And, you know, how many of you grew up in an environment where you could go play outside and you weren't supervised? Yeah. That doesn't happen so much anymore. Kids are structured in their playtime outside. They're in sports. The notion that the kids are just going to go out and run around in packs in the neighborhood is something that, you know, our culture is, um, you know, not embracing anymore. And it's, uh, it's a huge loss, and getting kids on bikes and walking and running are things that we are uh, hoping change that paradigm bit by bit. But it's interesting, you know, it's almost like turning the clock back. Nice, good question. Yes? What type of magic would you have to... Uh have bicyclists on the Eastern Trail use bells and ah. or speak up when they're coming up behind you. Okay, well, let me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it, that's a problem. I mean, every so I tell people every misbehaving bicyclist in the state, blame on me. So it, now, if you, you know, so it, 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 it's, it's all my fault. Uh, I'm trying to educate them more. Um, it is a problem. I mean, one of the things that we do, you know, I buy boxes of bells and give away bells. Um, and you know, maybe we do something with the Eastern Trail. We're around the trail. It's like, hey, you want a bike bell? Um, it's one of the things that I, I do have some funds to, to buy safety resources for. 
And as part of our you know, trainings, whenever we're actually educating people about how to ride bikes, we always tell them to um, you know, set, ring a bell or make some sort of verbal alarm before you overtake. On the Casco Bay Bridge, you might have seen the signs that now say, you know, when you go on the side path, which was designed as a sidewalk, but you know, again, kind of oversight on the part of the bridge designers. They didn't actually put in any kind of bike trail at all, any kind of bike accommodation. I don't even think they had a sidewalk on it. And Charlie LaFlame, who is the uh, founder of the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, led a huge fight to like say, no, you, you, you have to have something on that bridge because it connects South Portland and Portland. And people, you know, hundreds of people walk over it every day or ride bikes on it every day. But the sign that's on there actually says, you know, please ring a bell or verbalize that you're coming before you overtake people. And that was a sign that um, the Bicycle Coalition of Maine was involved with, uh, as long with the, uh, some folks from the city of South Portland, to try and solve a problem that was, um, you know, tough. More to say on that? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I do. And along the Eastern Trail, too, we have added, besides the signs that are in our kiosk, we have added signs at each road crossing, um, politely asking you to honor the rules of the trail, you know, announce announce that you're where you're riding, keep your dogs on the leash, etc. And unfortunately, there's always that few that spoil it for the many, so I, I think that we are all facing the same battle with it. When you're out there, call out to those that aren't doing it. And I get them, and email me more at info at easterntrail.org if there's an offender on it. We really try to track them down. The, um, the Eastern Trail, once it's built, has the local municipalities, um, some municipalities actually patrol it on bike during the summer months to, to try to control some of that, so yeah. keep, keep telling us about it and, and we'll keep and, trying. And model good behavior. <laughs> you know, when you're out there yourself, you know, conspicuously model what you should do. You have a mirror so that you can see it unless they go on 25 miles an hour. I don't want to get a walking there. The rear view mirror for walking. Yes, sir. In terms of getting your separate set of bike pads up to a more desirable model, what are the options? I have asked the question a few times, and a lot of people will say people construction companies that lobby the uh, legislatures and the uh, politicians and the bureaucrats, but these so-called evil construction companies are the same companies that are going to build your bridge, your... Yep. I mean, why can't you get in with some... find a, a real champion among the, the construction industry? Well, and, and, and that's beginning to happen. I mean, so um, national studies show that bike projects, bike ped projects, actually create more jobs than bigger road projects. They require more hand labor, they require more people out of machines doing some raking and digging, so they're great for business. Um, I don't know, you know, in, in terms of cost, um, you know, whether that is um, a disincentive for the businesses that you know they have to pay more labor charges. You know, that, that's a that's. If I knew the answer to that question, I would really be tackling it a little harder. I think we're still trying to probe around it. We had a meeting yesterday with the deputy commissioner of the main DOT, and we asked him point blank. So, how come you'll build? you know, a rotary at 100%, but if we want a, a, you know, a regional bike path, we have to come up with 20% of that local match. And he thought about it for a second, and he said, you know, I don't know the answer either. So I think what you're dealing with, it's, it's, it's tradition. It's, again, it's the paradigm that we live in, and I think the more that we talk about the need to make that fundamental change, the more likely we are to see that change happen. So, uh, you know, I feel optimistic that given time, um, at least in the Northeast, I think that people are getting it, but, um, you know, there's, there's just a, a belief that these sorts of things aren't essential transportation. They're amenities, they're luxuries, and I, I vehemently disagree with that. I think they are quality of life components that are part of a complete transportation system. So. Um, I don't have a great answer to that, but um, we're working on trying to figure that one out. I have a question. Way back there, Molly. Yes. Um, so going back to the slide that had the timeline, which was the ambitious goal to uh, have the Scarborough Gap complete by December 2017, which is awesome. Yes. I was curious what the target date is to have the match funding 
at least commi committed, and also to describe what happens if we don't get that match in time. I'm going to take the second question first. Failure is not an option. We okay. lock the doors. We are, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy, chain the doors. <laughs> uh, we are. Uh, so the, the commitments really need to be in place by December 2016. Okay. Um, so we're, we're hustling right now to try and come up with those commitments. Um, you know, it remains to be seen what will happen if that is not achieved. Um, you know, a good part of me believes that we're going to be able to sell DOT on the notion of, hey, this is, a, this is this trail of, you know, national, state, and local significance. And, um, you know, thanks, but we, we might need more help. Um, but really, that, that's not a good option. Um, the option that's best is for us to raise the money and be successful and be able to get the 80% uh, the match for our 20% share. And so that's why we're pushing hard. That's why we need all of you to push hard. The call to action here isn't simply to listen to me and nod your head and be like, oh yeah, that sounds pretty good. Maybe I'll, I'll give something. It's like, I want you to give something, but more importantly, I want you to activate your network. I want you to get other people giving stuff, um, contributing to this cause. Because this is, this is really one of those almost once in a lifetime opportunities to be involved with the completion of something that's going to outlive you, that's going to be great forever. Um, let's make this happen, people. Dan. Um, two uh, questions and a recommendation. One, the question is, uh, is the uh, 8020 funding scheme related to the money that's already been raised or the money that needs to be raised? So of the remaining $1 million, does really only 20% of that need to be raised in cash? No, it's really, the, the million really is the match. And then yeah. the recommendation is, is there a way to keep, in the next six months, the goal is November 2016, is there a way to keep people informed, maybe on the Eastern Trail's website, of the money that's been raised? Is there a you know, thermometer? A thermometer? I'll let Carol do that. <laughs> You've got a damn hat, you know. Um, yes, there is. There is a, on the front page of our website, there is a button saying close the gap for more information. If you click on that, it will take you to where you can donate now. Um, the top news stories that are published on the progress of it are also on the front page of the website and are updated as soon as we get them. Um, I am uh, trying to learn Facebook 101. <laughs> Keep up to date on that. So you can also check on there for it, and we've sent out e newses to anyone who um, has given the, us their email address for it. Yeah. And, and I just yeah. add, um, so the Close the Gap Committee actually has got some pretty, pretty heavy hitters on it. We, we actually have a woman who is a, a professional PR and communications consultant, and she has been fantastic in terms of like, when something happens, we'll make a splash. So the idea is that, you know, as, as a donation comes in, there will be some some press about it and some information about it because we're you know we know that we're going to have to do a number of things to keep this campaign in the public eye. Yes. Uh, I have a question. When you donate money to the Eastern Trail, is it one uh, foundation or one pocket that's going towards this um, this close the gap, or is there a specific close the gap um, to donate? <laughs> There is a specific close the gap button to hit on the front page of it. And that will take you there. The other thing I want to say is my husband and I ride a lot, um, and we ride a lot out of the state because there's not a whole lot of trails in our state. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> we ride a lot out of the state because there's not a whole lot of trails in our state. And that makes me really sad to have to leave our state to ride. And first of all, especially down in this lower uh, quarter of Maine, tourists, that is our big industry. And if we don't keep pushing that, I mean, our state has very little to, to offer our young people. Our young people are leaving because there's nothing here. We have tourists, that's, that's our industry. So when we travel, and I know 
Biking is huge now. The trails are huge. When we go anywhere now, we look where are the trails. That's where we're going to stay. So, um, so not only are we looking to vacation where the trails are, we're also looking to like, take Florida. And I know there's a big difference between southern states and northern states, you know, with commuting by, by bike. However, down there, they have trails dis designed for commuting. Their trails either have a C on it or they have a D. It's either for commuting or it's destination rides. Destinations, you know, for, for pleasure or whatever, but the commuting ones are specifically um, for commuting back and forth to work. So anyways, the way to change that is to everybody call your legislators, your senators, your um, representatives, any, any politician that you can possibly call. Call and tell them, I want this. I want my taxi to go to this. I love that. I agree with that completely. without going on the road. So they have been huge in supporting us tonight. Is there a close to gap sticker or something? We can stick on our cars, on our bikes, on our backpacks. There probably could be. <laughs> but we don't, we, no, there's not, not at the moment. Yeah, not yet, but that is a good idea. We will take ideas as well as donations. We will take ideas. Um, there is an Eastern Trail support st sticker, and I will say on, um, Gosh, it's a week from Saturday, National Trails Day, there will be some of us posted at the kiosks along the trail to again talk more about closing the gaps and collecting, literally sitting there with, at that point, probably jars and squares <laughs> to collect some donations and to raise the awareness. And shortly there will be a large kiosk and all of the posters along the, the trail too where you can, uh, what is it, it's the QR code? QR code? Yeah. 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 Be a web so that, yeah. So we're making it as easy as possible, and, and again, email us with any suggestions. Can I put a little plug in? You certainly can. So this Saturday at the Nonantas, if anybody is feeling up to going to the Nonantas buffet, we will be getting a portion of, their, uh, of the fee to go to the Close the Gap and the Eastern Trail. So it's a benefit breakfast, and we welcome everybody. It's no reservations, and it would be a great thing to... Uh, to bring your families to. And the Nonance and McKinney Bulk Court, one of the nicest hotels down there. Any more questions? One more question? In making this contribution, is there an option to pledge an amount to be paid over two or three years or whatever, uh, to spread it out? a little bit, or is that too much of a book you can issue to think about? We can, I was just going to say, we can deal with that. We can certainly deal with that. There are pledge cards on your table. Please feel free to take them with you. Hand them to us on your way out. Uh, we will take your money any way you want to give it. <laughs> but that, 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 that's actually one of the things we're thinking about for the corporate donations as well, that, that, that they would be able to you know, structure their give so that, you know, right now, a lot of corporations have already, like, done their charitable giving for the year. We're hoping to get a commitment for the next year, and it might even be, you know, just phased somehow. So, yes, we can and make that. that would count towards the, the money that you need to get the match. The, the cash donations are, are what are going to count. Yeah, the commitment, if the commitment exists, uh, the project will go forward. If there are no more questions, I think uh, I'm going to say goodnight. I'll let Carol say final farewells, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate the huge amount of support for us and just coming out here tonight. Tell your friends, tell your families, tell, tell anybody on the trail. I, I actually, I uh, have one closing story. I was on the trail one day watching um, construction be completed and an individual passed me and said, when are you going to close that gap? And I said, as soon as we get the funding for it. And it was a nice circumstance and a half an hour later this individual had uh, committed to a $2,500 donation. So you just never know when you're going to be on that trail. Tell everybody. <laughs>